the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is in our midst. He is and ever shall be. So, in these days of very troubling and very serious social fracturing, we ought to be scared of this. This is not good. We are in perilous and dangerous times. In this day and in this era of social fracturing, it's all the more necessary and important that we dig deeper into our faith, that we establish ourselves as Orthodox Christians to a measure that is deeper than what we have experienced in the past. And what that means is we've got to commit ourselves more to Christ. We have to live seeking Him so that we might be transformed in His image. Why do I say that? Because the reason there is social fra fracturing is because the faith Religion is the glue that holds a culture together. Religion is the ground of culture. Culture, the way in which we live, how we treat each other, how we conduct business, the kind of buildings we design, how we use technology, whether for evil or for good. Culture, what the world is that we have created, is grounded on religion. Culture, you could say, is the an expression of what people really believe in their hearts. And religion is passed primarily through culture. What do I mean? We worship at, in a certain way as Orthodox. That's Orthodox culture. The way we worship comes from our religion. It goes way back from our faith that goes way back even to the Old Testament and it is brought forward. How do we learn how to worship? We don't learn how to worship from a book. We learn how to worship by doing it. And by doing it, we are shaped by what we do and that informs our faith and develops our heart. So religion and culture are deeply related. How one believes, ultimately, is how one lives. How one lives reveals what one really believes. This is true on an individual, individual level. It is true on a social level as well. So, when we see culture slash society fracturing, we know ultimately if it continues in this way, it cannot hold. And it won't hold if there is no religion, no faith functioning as the social glue. A ligament joins the muscle and the bone. That's where the word religion comes from. It means the same thing, that which joins together. Religion, L-I-G, ligament, L-I-G. It has the same origin, the meaning of the word. So we ought to be alarmed. We ought to be very alarmed. And we ought to take this very seriously, and most of us do. But what we ought not to do is slip into anxiety and fear. It is a call to us to ground ourselves ever more deeply in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If, if the fracturing continues, if the fracturing continues, the America that once was will not be the America that is coming. And I don't say this to alarm you, but I say this to warn you. 
because if the times grow more difficult in the upcoming years and in the next decade, there's going to be pressure on us. There's going to be pressure on us as Christians. There will be, because the conflict is not just about policy. The conflict is about how you see the world and what a man and a woman is. Thus, what will happen is that to be a Christian will impose a greater cost on us than what we are experiencing now. It will, in some measure, replicate what the early Christians went through. So if one is to be a Christian, there will be a social penalty. And the Christian today will have to decide for himself, will I pay that penalty or will I go for the easier route? Now what do I mean by that? The Christians in early Rome were persecuted for what? For not giving a pinch of incense to Caesar. They weren't persecuted for being Christian per se. They were persecuted for what they would not do. Because giving a pinch of incense to Caesar was the way of showing publicly that you agreed with the Roman system. What was the Roman system? The Roman system was that Caesar was declared as God, and as long as we saw Caesar as the God, then all the disparate religions of the empire could somehow work together because they all confessed a common God, and that God was Caesar. Remember how I said that religion is the glue that holds a society together? That was a religion. If everyone confessed that they believed in Caesar and you displayed your confession by picking up a, a pinch of incense and throwing it in a fire where there's a picture of Caesar or a statue of Caesar, even if you didn't believe it, you still did it because it held things together. The Christians couldn't do that. By conscience, they could not do it. Not they they wanted to enter into this conflict, but they had to enter into this conflict in order to remain faithful Christians. Because why? Because there's only one God, and that's the God of Abraham. And Caesar is not a God, and we cannot throw a pinch of incense to Caesar because we understand that the symbolic meaning of that and it betrays our faith because it is not what we confess. And consequently then they became a pretext for persecution. What I'm saying is that they became the justification for certain political actions by the other leaders right to 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 persecute them. That gets a little complicated. I won't get into that right now. But that's what it was about. Now at the same time, at the same time, now the persecution wasn't constant. There were waves and periods of persecution. Okay, but at the same time, they really knew Christ. So when we read in the gospel, here's how the gospel fits into this. We read in the gospel, we see that everything that Christ is, he would give to his apostles, and then through the apostles to us. And the life and the power of Christ is transformative. <clears throat> he wants the apostles, the disciples at that time, they became <coughs> apostles. He wants the apostles to experience the same joy that he has as son of the Father. This is transformative power. This is life. This is the path of life. This is a return to the one who created us, the one, the one whom we serve, the one who orders our lives, especially on the inside. This is given to those who believe, and the early Christians experienced that. 
So paying the cost for being a Christian, undergoing that persecution, shows us something. That this faith that they have given to us, and the martyr shows the same thing, that this faith that they have given to us must be so deep, must be so good, must be so life-giving that it's better than life itself. That's what it shows us. So what is it that they knew that we don't? I contend it's a whole lot. But it's the same faith. And so what happens if we have to pay a cost for believing? Well, we're going to have to dig deeper into our faith and discover what they knew. Because what they knew is a whole lot better than having no faith at all. And it's also better than having a weak and lukewarm faith. Because a weak and lukewarm faith isn't going to cut it. It's not going to work anymore. What, what the early Christians did, it's remarkable. You look at their life. You look at their life in the first three centuries. I'll give you an example. Back then, if you wanted to get rid of a child, <clears throat> what you do is you waited a child. The child was born before you discarded the child. And the, what they did is they would put the children on the road leading to the dump. And at night, the wolves would come and it would eat the children. That's how they got rid of the children they didn't want. The Christians, they, they, they just could not bear this. They could not bear this. They used to go out at night, and they used to rescue these children, and they would raise them as their own. They would raise them as their own. Now, now the world was cruel back then. It was really cruel. And the pagans, the non-believers, let's call them the non-Christians, they could not comprehend why anybody would do this. But the Christians did it, of course, because they saw something about God and they saw something about love that had not yet entered the world. And in so doing, and this was their, this was their testimony, this was their life, and what happened was, even though they were persecuted, and even though they did not fight back against their persecutors, doesn't mean that they were ignorant. All right? It doesn't mean that. I mean, it, there, was, there was deep intelligence and deep sobriety going into their decisions. It wasn't just a shallow, moralistic decision of the kind we see all around us today. People don't think today. They thought. So let's not oversimplify this. But they did not persecute their persecutors. They loved their enemies. But they also did things like rescue the babies, feed the poor, all these other things. And what they ended up doing was they ended up transforming the conscience of the people. They transformed the conscience of the people. This was such a blazing light. This was so new because, the, because it was still a pagan culture. And pagan cultures were very cruel. Very cruel places to live. It transformed the consciousness of the people so that when Constantine came and saw the cross in the sky and got the idea, because it was given to him by God himself, that the God above all gods is indeed the God of Abraham, and that this God came and visited men as Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, because the sign that he saw was a cross, that when the persecutions were lifted, the people were ready to receive the faith. Their consciousness, their consciences were prepared for it. It's a really remarkable thing. 
Now we might be ending, we might be entering a darker period. We might be. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the great Russian dissident, the man who single-handedly destroyed the Marxist academic establishment of Western Europe with the publication of the Gulags, spoke at Harvard University in 1976, and you can see a video of it on YouTube warning us of exactly this type of thing. That when we forget God, when we forget God, and he's actually quoting from Dostoevsky when he says this, all things are possible. Freedom is confused with licentiousness and the lack of inner restraint. And when a man becomes licentious, and when a man loses his inner restraint, anarchy is leashed upon the world. When men stop believing in God, they will believe in anything. That's the problem. That's the problem. And we, as a culture, might be entering a period like that. I don't say this to, to foster anxiety, although it will make us anxious. I say this to increase sobriety and bring awareness of the call to take our faith more seriously. We have to. Someone has to bring light into the world. Someone has to bring the gospel to the confused that are looking for truth. Someone has to provide the aid to the robber on the road like the good Samaritan. Someone has to provide the direction. Someone has to provide the shelter. That's our job. And we're going to have to do this more and better than we have if what I sense is coming does indeed come. And God will give us strength. And God will give us protection. And God will give us wisdom. And God will give us opportunity. But this is something we might have to do, my brothers and sisters in Christ. It starts, it starts, as I say, by, by drawing more closely to Christ so that his power can be in us, just like we read about in the scripture. He is in the Father, and he wants us to be in him. And that's where wholeness and health and life comes. And this is what we think about when we watch our cities burn on television. It's very serious. It's very serious. I could cry, I'm telling you, when, when I see a person's business burn, I know what it took for that family to build that business and to have it arbitrarily taken away from them, a lifetime of work, and a guarantee of a stable future just wiped out by a senseless, mindless act of anarchy, we are in trouble. We are in trouble. I'm trying not to get angry. I get angry. I'm trying not to get angry. I really am. But, but all of us who have worked and built things understand how much it takes to build something like that and make it flourish. No one has the right. No one has the right, and this is what America used to be, to take that away from you. And now it's happening again and again and again, and it's spiraling out of control. What is happening to us as a people? I ask myself, what is happening to America? What's happening to America is Men are, and I'm quoting Solzhenitsyn here, 
Men are forgetting God. That's what's happening. Solzhenitsyn talks about the, the you know, the, the, the catastrophic imposition, it's just catastrophic to Russian culture. The imposition of, of the Marxist ideology, Lenin, Stalin, all that. And he said, people ask, why did this happen to us? And he said, here's the answer. Men have forgotten God. That's why it happens. When men forget God, they believe anything, which means everything is justifiable. But these things are not justifiable. They're not justifiable. But if you stand against that and say this is not justifiable, you, if you say this is happening because men have forgotten God, expect it. It's going to happen. They're going to turn. Some people are going to turn on you because God is the only appealing to God. God is the only repudiation of this anarchy. It is because it's fundamentally about faith. It's fundamentally about religion. It's fundamentally about the orientation of the heart. Culture comes, culture expresses what we believe. Religion is the ground of culture. How a man lives is really what he believes, see? As I said at the very outset, so ultimately, Ultimately, this is about the heart. This is about the heart of man. My heart, your heart, the heart of the man on the street, the heart of the man burning down somebody's business, the heart of the man whose business has been burnt. And for that reason, we have to understand this. We have to understand this because then we'll process correctly. For that reason, where our own life, our own heart lies is so important as well. So, through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, may the Lord have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Please rise.